And it's not so much about fixing the disability or fixing the thing that's afflicting an individual. It's more so the acceptance in society on how that individual can be successful. Emphasizing that problem-solving aspect of RAM is one thing that as blind people, we've all had to do in our lives to come up with, well, how can you do something? If, if people say, how do you manage that? We have to sit down and come up with a way. And that's a lot of what being on a RAM team is all about. The event is Race Across America, success in plain sight. You can learn more about Team C2C on the web at teamseatose.com and on Facebook, Team C2C. We really want to encourage people who have disabilities, encourage people who are blind, young folks who are coming up, people who are growing in their careers, even people who are established, to say, hey, you can reach for that next thing. Don't be counted out. Don't count yourself out. We're not going to count ourselves out until we get to the Atlantic Ocean. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Have you ever had the urge to go across America from the Pacific Coast to the Atlantic Coast? How about race across America? That's a race that starts on the Pacific Coast and goes all the way nonstop to the Atlantic Coast. Yeah, that's right. From start to finish, nonstop. There's a team called C2C, and that's S E A T O S E E, and it's comprised of four members. There's four stokers, all blind, one bike on the road at a time. They'll be rotating in and out, racing, and they plan on doing it in eight days. Although there's plenty of people involved in this event, we have three out of the four stokers. That's the person on the back of the tandem bike, and with us today, we have Jack Chen, Daniel Berlin, and Tina Amant. So Jack, why don't you introduce yourself and introduce the rest of your team? Thanks, Jeff. Glad to be with you again here and really glad to be able to have the opportunity to introduce C2C. C2C is a project that was started, oh, I don't know, about six months ago. We were sitting around trying to think, what is something completely epic that we could do? What's something that's really going to capture the hearts and minds of people? And we were sitting around and thinking, not sure what that could be. And then someone said, what about biking across the country? And I said, wow, that sounds that, that sounds cool. And I've never heard about Race Across America, but biking across the country sounds like it's tough enough. And then Race Across America comes. It's a 3,000 mile race from California to Maryland. It goes across 12 states, has 175,000 feet of elevation gain along the way. And it's what they call a one stage bike race, which means that there is no scheduled stop. The team will go 24 hours a day until we finish, and we get a max of nine days. So that's kind of the event itself. But more than the event, we were thinking about what is something that we could do that is not only epic, but could really make an epic difference in the lives of people with disabilities and people who are blind. And along with the race, we decided, what if we could highlight the success and capabilities of people who are blind? What if we could show the world that there is this incredible physical activity, physical adventure that blind people can do, but do something even more? So we could talk about what about people who are successful who are blind? What kinds of things can they do off the bike? And we assembled a group of folks who all in their own right have incredible success. And what we want to do ultimately is to highlight blindness and success, to talk about what people can do, what they're capable of, what they've already done, people who are blind, and talk about their own lives and what they've accomplished off the bike as well as on the bike. We want to create a full-length film about this adventure using the race as a way to say, hey, there's something incredible that some people are trying to, to do here on the bike and then talk about off the bike and look at what else blind people around the world can do, what success that they can have. That's how the race got started. And I'll just introduce myself quickly and then pass it off to the other folks on the call. Uh, I'm Jack Chen. I am an attorney at Google. In my previous history, I did the Ironman triathlon in Florida uh, and New York in 2010 and 2012, respectively, and have done a bunch of other things like marathons and, and uh, climbing Kilimanjaro, Jeff, as you and I had spoke about earlier. And that's a little bit about my history. Dan, you want to you wanna go next? 
Sure, sounds good. Well, thanks, Jack. And um, yeah, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, a little bit about this event for me, the way it started out, just as Jack said, uh, us sitting around talking about something epic that could be done by individuals who are blind and really make a, a lasting impact or imprint on the world and finding something that's um, arguably the most challenging bike race in the world and one of the most toughest physical events in the world was right up our alley. You know, all four of us, this is the type of thing we go for. On top of that, I'm also the um, co-founder and CEO of Rodell Incorporated, which is uh, one of the world's leading vanilla extract companies. When not riding and training, I spend a lot of time making, tasting, eating, all these things I love to do. And I, I joke that I got into athletics because of my job, because I was um, eating cookies all day long. And one thing led to another. I could eat more cookies if I started training, you know, six hours a day. No, really, this gets down to a few years ago, I also co-founded an organization with several friends of mine called Team C Possibilities, where we take on epic endurance challenges all around the world, supporting children who are blind, mostly outside the U.S., one of my passions is really focusing on the societal acceptance of difference. And oftentimes that difference is a disability. In my case specifically, it's blindness. And because of my business and my work life, it gives me the opportunity to work extensively in Africa and Asia and Southeast Asia and parts of the world where disability has a different connotation than it does to us here in the States. And there's a lot of work to be done. And it's not so much about fixing the disability or fixing the thing that's afflicting an individual. It's more so the acceptance in society on how that individual can be successful. And to me, that's what this ROM team is all about. It's showing how where there's a will, there's a way. And if four of us blind stokers can find a way to compete in the most challenging physical event in the world, you know, we'll find a way to do it. Daniel, that's terrific. I was impressed when reading about some of the events that you were involved in. Your team was coming down a mountain, I mean, pretty exhausted, and yet you took the time to go visit a school for blind children. I was very impressed. That's a, that's a key part of what we do is our, our mission. We love the epic endurance adventures around the world. Our mission is or our philosophy is to choose, you know, X adventure and Y iconic location for Z cause. And the cause is so important to that because children are the future. And just the message we can send to them about don't be labeled or don't label yourself even is so important. And that's why the documentary part of this project is so important. You know, we'll capture attention, I'm sure, in doing the ride. But what really can be the lasting part of this is the um, imprint we leave through the documentary behind about the ability that is in all of us. And the third member of Team C2C with us is Tina Ament. Hi, I'm Tina. And thank you so much for having us on the podcast. I am a, an assistant United States attorney for the District of Columbia. I live in Virginia, but I work in D.C. That is basically for 10 years. I've been a trial lawyer trying all kinds of crimes that are committed in D.C. And for the last 10 years, I've been doing appeals, which means that I try to preserve the convictions that my colleagues get at the trial level. So I spend my days writing briefs and doing oral arguments in the D.C. Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And when I'm not doing that, I'm training most of the time. I grew up as a military brat, and my both of my parents were very convinced that my blind sister and I should be able to take on whatever challenges we wanted, and particularly that we should be physically fit. So I grew up doing swim team, downhill skiing, horseback riding. And after I got out of law school and got out of private practice where I was too busy to ever do much of anything, I took on competitive rowing. I'm a master's national champion rower and then switched over to marathons and triathlons. I'm an eight-time Ironman. I actually qualified to do solo race across America by doing a 24-hour bike race where my pilot and I finished third overall of all the competitors at a 24-hour race in Texas. And this weekend, I became the national hill climb champion for blind and visually impaired by climbing Pikes Peak on a tandem. Wow, Tina. That's all I got. Wow. Uh, um, I really am excited about this team. And I think the one thing that Jack didn't kind of go into is when you put together a Race Across America team, there's a lot that goes into it. 
more than just being physically fit and extremely well trained, which we all are. But I had the privilege actually of towing the line with Jack at Ironman New York. We've been race competitors before and, and the training is very important. But the other thing that I think is going to be lasting about this is the idea that you have to problem solve for every contingency that might come up in getting four tandems and their accompanying vehicles across the country in some very tough conditions. Everybody has to basically be a MacGyver and a problem solver and a team member. So in addition to the eight of us, there are going to be a lot of crew members who do the important work of making sure that our vehicles are where they need to be, that our food is where it needs to be, that the vehicles stay maintained, etc. And I think that emphasizing that problem-solving aspect of RAM is one thing that as blind people, we've all had to do in our lives to come up with, well, mm-hmm. how can you do something? If, if people say, how do you manage that? We have to sit down and come up with a way. And that's a lot of what being on a RAM team is all about, or being a solo RAM racer. It's finding a way to do your role to the best of your ability and to get everyone else to do their roles so that the whole team is successful. When reading up on all of you, I I noticed that some of the articles would say runner climbs Kilimanjaro or runner. But in the Ironman, there is the aspect of bicycling. So it was just kind of surprising at first when I was reading to see all of you biking across America. And now I see, you know, you, you've You've all done quite a bit of biking. Well, from from my point of view, ever since I started bike riding, I've heard about RAM and hope to be able to do RAM someday. And one of our pilots has been on a RAM team, and I went to Annapolis to watch her team cross the line. So to me, when, when you're a triathlete, you know, you do all these sports, but you also you know, I've sort of been gravitating more toward bike racing in the past couple of years. I've been injured and my running's kind of not where I'd like it to be right now. So I'm taking a break from Ironman and trying to do more bike racing like the hill climb this weekend. So for me, it's sort of a natural extension of doing longer and tougher bike rides to think that Ram would be a really great project to do. And when I heard these guys were setting up a team, I thought about trying to set up one myself. And then I thought, hey, if they've already done some work, I'm just jumping on their coattails because <laughs> it's not an easy project to do. <laughs> Race across America. Yeah, that's what you do when you take a break. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take a break from yeah. Iron Man, yeah. <laughs> and this is Dan. I think, you know, e- each of us are different and approaching this a different way. We're always learning new stuff about each other. And now that we just learned that Tina is the National Hill t- Climb Champion, we know exactly which leg she's going to be doing. Yes, that whole mountain range. <laughs> Tina, that's all you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kidding. I'll take the eastern slope of the Rockies. You can take the western and then we'll... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I must say, you know, we haven't announced our um, fourth teammate as well. Michael Thompson is our fourth blind stoker as well. He wasn't able to join us today, but um, he is a vital part of the team. Looking forward to doing this event, you know, as all four of us and our four pilots along with us too. And I must say, though, being the only non lawyer among the four stokers here i think we're going to be a good problem solving team now i'm wondering if you can help out our listeners all of you including michael are stokers you ride in the back of the tandem bike and you have a captain a pilot where did the pilots come from can you explain a little bit about how your teams are set up you know um each of us has worked with very captains i mean having to do a an Ironman triathlon um, on a tandem, you also need to have captains who are crazy enough to ride 110, 112 miles at a shot. And so each of the captains that we have chosen, we've also, I believe, worked with uh, as well. So my captain is who I did my last Ironman triathlon with. I know Dan's captain is someone he's done a number of races with before, mostly in the running side and, and the climbing with Team C possibility. I know that Michael's captain is someone who I believe was a captain also during the last Ironman that I did with Tina. And I think Tina was your captain, right? Is that right? Uh, that's right. Both of the women pilots that are with our group have been pilots for me in races. So Carolyn Gaynor will be piloting for Michael. And I'm going to be riding with Pamela Ferguson, who is another pilot that I've done so mostly bike races with, actually. And she and I got the great result in Texas where we finished third overall on, in a 24-hour race. And she also was on the winning team in the first third of Race Across America, which is called Race Across the West this year. So she's an incredible endurance athlete and more of a cyclist than either of the other sports, but she's also amazing at swimming and running too. And so all of our 
pilots have had guiding experience, and all of them, I believe, are Ironman, just like all of us are. And that's a great question, too, just in the fact that, for me, honestly, this is Dan. The hardest decision I had going into this was choosing a pilot. Because the beauty, the gift of being a blind athlete and putting it out there and going to do these races are the people that come in that want to help and that volunteer their time to come and join and help. And for me, having a lot of friends that have guided me in the past, choosing one to be the captain along this adventure was a challenge too. It really makes it a team sport between us, but also between our guides and us. I always hear the word team being mentioned by all of you and, you know, the rules the for the RAM and all the regulations, you know, you have support vehicles following bikes at night and all this. Can you explain some of this team and the crew and the, the rules, regulations of the RAM? So if you think about it, we're going to have eight cyclists and each of us will probably be bringing a spare tandem bike. So just in terms of us, if you don't even think of anything else, you're going to have to get eight people and eight tandems across the country. So we'll probably have one or two RVs with us and one or two vans with us. And during the nighttime hours and on the Indian reservations, the RAM rules require that one of the vehicles direct follows the cyclists. And that's for safety because we're riding on trafficked roads. You need to have a support vehicle to light your way, to warn the other cars that you're there et cetera, et cetera. So for safety, there has to be direct follow for a good bit of the race. And then during the daylight hours, that vehicle can sometimes go ahead to help with swapping out riders. So what the crew has to do is convey, you know, you need people to drive and navigate because remember it's 3,100 miles that they're going to be navigating on back roads that the race has set up a specific route. And if you go off route, you have to turn around and go back and retrace your steps. So nobody wants to be the one who screws up the navigation. Mm -hmm. There has to be food for all those people that's put into those cars and ready to eat. And if you think about it, nobody's really getting very much sleep during this time. So by the time you get to the end of this, the crew is basically telling the riders, now is when you eat, now is when you sleep, now is when you do everything. Mm. They, they really run the show. Having a good crew and a good crew chief is imperative. If you don't have people who know what they're doing, you can have, you know, just disastrous results and not finish the race. Cookies, right, Dan? <laughs> well, you know, that crew keeping up with my paleo vegan diet is going to be a challenge, but uh, I have full faith. Can you explain to the listeners how this actually works? Is it like a Patan relay race? Do you like one bike on the road at a time and when you come across each other you kind of like hand the baton off if i may that's the that's <laughs> the best I, that's the closest idea that you have in your direct follow car you can have another pair of people waiting so once it's not following anymore it can move ahead drop off the people get them ready to get on their bike. And then when the bike that's on route comes up, it can stop and the other one takes off and then you load the other people into the van, et cetera. It's kind of like this complete logistical ballet with RVs and vans and bikes where everybody has to sort of be where they need to be at the right time. And that's why having a crew chief that's good at logistics and good at navigation is absolutely crucial. All of you have such great experience that you can draw from, you know, the people that you've met, the people you've worked with in the past, but the RAM is new to all of you. So how's it going in setting up this team for the first time? Well, we're still working on um, putting together our, our perfect crew right now. One of the things we realized is having RAM experience is very important, especially for the crew chief and some of the other key roles, the assistant crew chief, navigators. So we're piecing that together along the way. That really makes the difference. And then we can't forget, you know, sleep. One of the biggest resources that we have on this adventure, say, at seven to eight days, we have a crew of, say, um, 17, 18 people plus the eight riders. We need to trade off sleep time. We need to trade off food and um, all the other things along the way. So just having that master puppeteer who's guiding all the orchestration out there is, is really key. We do have a lot of the connections. That's why I get back to before. We have so many friends and so many awesome folks along the way that picking just that precise crew that's going to lead to success is one of the hardest things we're doing right now. But I've got to say, I'm I mean, Jack has been really inspirational and instrumental in this part. We are recruiting as many other blind and vision impaired individuals along the way, too. So beyond our actual crew, 
we have several other blind VI individuals doing lots of different functions from marketing to fundraising to promotions, discussing on um, film production and things like that along the way, which is really an amazing story about not just four blind stokers riding this race, but about a whole team pulled together. Right. And one of the things that's exciting about this part of the race planning is we want to highlight what the full capabilities are of people who are blind, you know, on and off the bike, as we said. And so it was very important to us to identify people who are incredibly talented as well uh, and in their own right, who would be passionate about taking part in this kind of way to make an impact in the world and to highlight the skills that they have. I mean, it's difficult. Media and PR is hard. Fundraising is hard. And the folks that we have found already are incredible at what they do. And we want the world to see that, yeah, you need this guy in your media department. You need this guy in your fundraising department because of the skills and the deep bench that's available in the blind talent space. So we want folks to realize that blind people can do anything. And at the same time, we really want to encourage people who have disabilities, encourage people who are blind, young folks who are coming up, people who are growing in their careers, even people who are established to say, hey, you can reach for that next thing. Don't be counted out. Don't count yourself out. We're not going to count ourselves out until we get to the Atlantic Ocean. You know, the whole team is called Sea to Sea, which means going to the sea on the East Coast of the United States so that the world can see, S-E-E, what the full capabilities of blind people are around the world. So it's really about helping the world to see S-E-E through our accomplishment of getting to the C-S-E-A. Such a great opportunity to educate the public about the possibilities. Now, Jack, you mentioned Lime Connect, and Daniel, you mentioned Team C possibilities. I was wondering, is Team C2C going to be an organization? As you put this project together, it's hard to foresee where this will go. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, it is not yet an organization. Really, it was just birthed out of the desire, um, which we talked about earlier, to to do something which highlighted our own capabilities and the capabilities of people who are blind. But it is going to be about making an impact for the future and impact for posterity. Who knows where the project will take itself? You know, um, we want to, to see this in the minds of people around the world. I mean, then if it takes off and people create more around it, then yes, that would be awesome. Uh, We'd love to see it grow in that way. But we're taking a bold step now to put this out there, to, to do something that's, as Dan said, arguably, we don't know whether we can do this, right? To go out there and to succeed and then to have this highlighted in a film so that people for generations can watch it. And hopefully this sparks something. Obviously, the clock is ticking. Can you tell when the race across America begins? The race starts in June of 2018. So we've got about 10 months to prepare. And that 10 months, while it sounds like a lot, actually is uh, quite challenging. We've got uh, to put together all of our fundraising. We've got to get all of our media straight. We've got to find the film. We've got to write the overall script for the film. We've got to find the crew. We've got to plan to have some kind of training for the whole team along the way. It's going to be a tight 10 months. It's going to be a tight 10 months. All while we're working our our job. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Say, yeah, not to mention while we're working. <laughs> and and family too, right? Work, family, oh, and yeah. <laughs> vacations and all those other kind of good things. Well, we'll see about the vacation part. But yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite talked my kids into that their vacation next year is driving across country in an RV while um, they have to feed us. But uh, <laughs> working on it. <laughs> but they get to yell at you and boss you around. That's the best, the good part about it. <laughs> they do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll get to the contacts and the show notes we'll put the links all in there and we'll mention it on here but i want to know are there going to be t-shirts available or other items to bring awareness to team c to c so they can help support the team oh i'm sure that we will because we'll have cycling kits to wear and once we contract with somebody or get somebody to make us the kits you know the designs will be in so i'm sure we'll have shirts for the crew and all that kind of stuff 
and signs for the cars and everything like that. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, this is a this is a very expensive venture too here. I mean, we are still actively in the fundraising stage. We've had one fantastic sponsor organization that's come on so far. And the way we estimate we're probably about twenty five to thirty percent of the way there we need to be to make this really happen too on the financial side. So there's a lot of work going on in the interim too. And as that builds, we'll definitely be working with our sponsors, hopefully to promote them and us and the mission along the way. It is just in case, in case it wasn't clear, this is a hugely expensive undertaking in addition to being complicated. I mean, just the race entries, 12,000 something, I think for a four tandem team. And then plus the rental cost to get all the vehicles, the travel costs to get everybody out to Oceanside for the start. And then the associated cost with getting everybody home once we're back in Maryland. So the fundraising and any support that people out there want to give, you know, be it $10 or some t-shirts or some food or whatever is totally appreciated because this is a, it, it, for anybody undertaking this, it's a hugely expensive endeavor. Oh, I can't even imagine that as I'm piecing this all together, just the puzzle pieces to make this picture really work for the race across America, uh, 25 people, two ve- three vehicles, possibly going all the way across the America in just eight days and all the personalities and everything. You guys are really taking on something big here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars. And one of the things we're doing, we'll see as this unrolls is we're really highlighting employment for the blind as well as a major driver behind what we're doing right now. Folks looking to be involved with that um, activity, we can help point them in the right direction and also maybe a good tie into what we're doing here. Because the employment rate for blind individuals, as I'm sure you know, is ridiculously high in the world of 4% national unemployment to have 60 to 70% plus unemployment for the College educated vision impaired community is is just not acceptable. Yeah, that's a number that hasn't fluctuated in many, many years. And it's events like this, which you guys are doing in the race across America, Team C to C, that may just shine a light on it for many people to realize the possibilities. And I was wondering, we've been talking for a while and we haven't really touched on blindness. I got a question. Is there any alternative devices that any of you will be utilizing on the road? That's a good question. Not as far as I know, but doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. I mean, one thing that that I've heard about this race anyway is that although everybody relies on GPS, uh, you know, uses GPS for navigation and that, some of the places we're going to be in are pretty remote. And so when it really comes down to it, I mean, people use a, a book. I mean, Ram gives you a book that has turn by turn directions in it for the entire race course. And that's what the default is that your navigators are supposed to use. You can plug those all into your GPS if you want to. But this is a pretty old school run race. And I think part of that is because the technology may not function for the entire 3000 miles. I mean, there's parts out there in the desert where, where there's not much to be found. Mm, That's a good point. And I think for each of us individually, we're going to use our own techniques and tools that work for us. I mean, I use a cane. I mean, I'll definitely have that with me for when I'm not on the bike. And there'll definitely be a a whole level of communication that we'll need to be working with the crew. And that's another excellent point, because that's something from the crew standpoint that's going to be different than crewing a fully sighted RAM team is that consistency for a vision impaired individual is key in making sure that we have consistency in the RV, consistency in um, our gear and equipment and things like that. It's going to be key along the way here. We want to say too, as far as we know, nobody's ever done this before. So this is also the first time this has ever been done with a full blind stoker team competing in RAM. But just looking at some of the intricacies that happen both in the RV, in the support vans, from gear and just staging and getting around, there's going to be this extra level of crew support that we'll be educating them along the way on how best to support each of us individually. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that in making the logistical plans, it's important that that we make sure that being de facto guides 24-7 doesn't fall 
to our poor pilots because they're going to need their downtime when nobody's asking them for anything too. When they're off the bike, you know, they're going to either need to be able to put in their headphones and listen to something or sleep or eat in quiet or not having somebody making any further demands on them because we have to remember they're doing a huge undertaking. It's hard for them to pilot a bike all night where you have to, you know, look ahead on a dark highway and, and this and that. And I know when I did that 24 hour race, Pamela was very, very, very tired. And the last thing she wanted to be doing was uh, stopping and helping me find clothes if they weren't packed in the right place or something like that. So our crew has to be able to, our, our crew people have to be able to help us with those functions so that the pilots can can have their downtime so that they'll be more alert when they're actually riding. I'm thinking about the geography and the different terrains that you'll be going through on your route from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And, you know, you got the Rockies, you got the desert, you know, been through the desert with a horse with no name. And then you got the flatlands. But not only that, you're going to hit the Appalachians, then you got all the high density population areas out east. Is there any particular area that is feared more than the others, or do they all have their own particular degree of difficulties? I think the one thing that, that from my little bit of research on this is that everybody says the eastern part of this country is the hardest. For one thing, the, the hills in West Virginia and, and Maryland are shorter than the ones in Colorado, but they're steeper and they are relentless. There's one segment of this because the way the race works is there are checkpoints. There's something like 50 some odd checkpoints across the race. Our crew checks in at those when we reach that point. That's how Ram knows where we are. And there's one checkpoint where there's 5,000 feet of climb over 80 miles from one checkpoint to the next, going from Ohio into West Virginia. And because that's the end of the race, that ends up being, I think, more taxing on everybody. And plus some of the roads in West Virginia, well, all of it, I have to emphasize, is, is pretty dangerous because you're out there with traffic, you're out there with trucks, and this isn't a race everybody knows is coming through town. Your average semi-driver has no idea that ram is occurring. Even the little towns you're going through it's not a big deal. It's not like when they have the New York City Marathon and everybody knows there's a marathon going on. This is just that the race kind of rolls through and people are rolling through over a 72-hour period between the solo racers and the teams. All of this is pretty dangerous and taxing. The desert can get up to 120 degrees and then you go from that right up to the mountains where it can be snowing to out in the plains where you can have massive thunderstorms that are so bad you have to stop because you can't see anything or there's hail. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to say which part of it and i think for all of us and all of our pilots there'll probably be different parts of it that are pretty taxing but i, I think for for anybody who's piloting one of these bikes the night riding is, is very grueling i mean only because you have to be so constantly paying attention one guy did ram this year on a hand cycle and he was on a descent going about 60 miles an hour and an elk stepped out ahead of him in his follow vehicle and he was just screaming into his radio you know dear 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 like figuring that their court team would crash into it and die so that's just the kind of thing that, that can happen at any time during the eight days or whatever that we're out there you know, wildlife trucks car breakdowns mechanicals on the bike any of it it's hard to say what's going to be the hardest and, and also because we don't know specifically what weather we'll be facing you know maybe we'll get lucky and uh and it won't be that hot or we won't get rained on or whatever but it's hard to say california to maryland just go tailwind all the way <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking to Jack Chen, Daniel Berlin, and Tina Ament. Just a great conversation about race across America, nonstop, Pacific Coast to the Atlantic. Is there anything else any of you would like to share with our listeners? For me, I would love just to have folks share what we're doing. Share it far and wide on Facebook, on Twitter. Tell people about Team c to c Tell them about what we're trying to do. Tell them about what we want to accomplish in the minds and hearts of America, to in the world, to talk about the capabilities of people who are blind, talk about their own limits, and have a conversation around the dinner table. It's like, hey, well, I've been struggling with this thing, and you know, I know, look, Team C to C, look what they're doing. They're on day three, and look where they are. They're really killing this thing. We want to be an inspiration for folks out there to challenge their own minds and hearts and share this widely. Mm. We want to hear from them. We want to hear what they're saying. We want to hear their support and their ideas along the way, too. It's just very important that we have a, a conversation about this, that we have a dialogue that goes on. And hopefully we'll be a, you know, a light out here that's going to help some folks say that they can do more than they think they can do right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree. When I did the 24-hour race in Texas, the race started at 7 at night. So we got our night riding out of the way. And it got very cold 
and very long getting 200 miles in before the sun came up. There were just points when I, I re- literally would think, I, I just don't know if I can pedal up this hill another time or get around the loop another time. I have this memory of I could feel it, and Pamela said it, when the sun first peeked over to our left-hand side, which was east of us on that part of the loop. And it was suddenly like, you know what, like, it's going to be okay. Like, the, you know, the, the, the sun will come out and uh, there, there is either a light at the end of the tunnel or a light to our east one way or the other. I hope that we can sort of show everybody that, uh, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, which is cliche, but it's, it's kind of true. Hmm. It reminds me of a story about you, Dan, when you're 800 feet from the summit of Kilimanjaro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that was... Um... That was challenging. I mean, it was dark. It was just cold. It was dark. I mean, Jack's been up there too. And you get there and then you just feel the warmth of the sun. And it's a, it's a whole different world. You know, that that's it. Hmm. Yeah, Jack doesn't talk too much about his climb. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I had some pretty dark moments there. Uh, you asked my wife, Jeff. I remember I was standing at this one point when uh, you know, as, as a blind person, to put this in perspective, you can feel three or four feet around you, right? The, the scariest thing is to think that there's an incredible drop off when there isn't, because it just petrifies you. You just can't walk any further. And I remember it was this really flat rock, wet, flat rock. Hmm. It was sloping down. And you had to walk down this thing having no idea how long it was or if there were boulders in the way you were going to run into and just being petrified. I, I couldn't move. I've never felt like that in my entire life. But that was the first time that I felt like I I, I, I just, what am I doing? I can't, I can't do this thing. And with their support, I got through it. But yeah, it was, there are some pretty dark moments up there. Oh, I hear you, Jack. I mean, like, sometimes, I mean, you flip it around, you say ignorance is bliss. I mean, when I did the rim to rim to rim in the Grand Canyon, there were parts on the North Rim where um, so my team that was with me, I'd feel this hand on my shoulder behind as we're hiking or, or moving, even jogging sometimes. So like, you know what? Uh, just take a step to your left a little bit more. <laughs> and then when I heard later from my family or from others watching the video that they were capturing, like, it was like a thousand, two thousand foot drop off, you know, six inches to my right. And we're you know, running through a carved out piece of rock. And I had no idea. I could have been hiking down the path in my neighborhood for all I knew. It was just like a, another day out there going. And uh, yeah, sometimes it's scary. And sometimes you don't even know it's scary. And Tina, I remember a story about you in the Iron Man in Hawaii when your light went out, leaving you both in the dark, kind of leveling the playing field a little bit. That's right. When, when we did Iron Man Kona, when the sun goes down on the big island, it goes down for real. Um, it's just sort of like it was light and then it's dark. And we're running along the Queen K Highway and there's no lights on that road. And we had mistakenly taken my headlamps and put it into our, they have a what they call a special needs bag in Iron Man that's, in, that's supposed to be sort of in the middle of the run. And you can pick up, so say you want an extra shirt or you want some food that you don't want to carry with you, you can leave it in your special needs bag. Well, the special needs bag in Kona is 19 miles or so into the run. And we had to cover, I think it was at least two two and a half miles in the dark on the Queen K before we got down into the energy lab where the special needs bag was. And so, yeah, it was to the point where we tried to sort of pirate off of other people that had their headlamps with them. Or if there was an aid station up ahead, you could got some weird light. But some of it was, she was like, well, I'm just going to try to, you know, have you not trip on the little markers on the road, the little plastic things that do the lane divides. But she's like, but I honestly can't see them. So we're just going to do the best we can. <laughs> Jack, can you tell our listeners where they can go and learn more about Team C2C? Follow what's going on, stay in touch with them, leave a donation. Where do they go for that, Jack? You can find us on our newly, freshly minted webpage at www.teamc2c. That's team S-E-A-T-O-S-E-E dot com. And we're also on Facebook at Team C2C. And just to close out and make sure people really understand what we're about. Team C to C, again, is really about writing to the C, S-E-A, so the world can see S-E-E, the full capabilities and the success of blind people. Our motto is success in plain sight. So we'd love to partner with you. We'd love to keep in touch with you, share some of our stories, let you get to know the team 
and props to the American Foundation for the Blind. For almost 100 years, the American Foundation for the Blind has built on the legacy of Helen Keller by connecting people with vision loss to the outside world and fighting for those who fought for us by giving a voice to those who need it, advocating for laws that help visually impaired people and helping us communicate with the world in a whole new way. Helen would be proud of the breakthroughs made for generations of Americans with vision loss. As for tomorrow, let's shoot for the moon. To learn more, visit AFB.org. And USABA. The great thing about these kind of programs, what USABA does, is they allow guys and gals who maybe have similar issues, similar problems, similar experiences to come together to share information about the blind community, about sports, about how you can be more productive and enjoy life and have fun. Sports will always be in my life. Uh, it makes you feel better. It's almost proving something to yourself that you're able to pull through maybe something that's very challenging and come out the other end. So connect with us, like our Facebook page, come and visit us, and if you're able to and you want to, please support us. But it'll yeah. be worth it. So blessed to, to have Dan and Tina and Michael all in the same boat together and then all these other support folks in our corner. It's been an incredible journey so far and we have a ways to go, but we're going to be bringing more folks on board and just their support is going to be incredible. We definitely could not do it without the help of a ton of folks. And for all your listeners out there, we love your help too. Well, thank you very much, Jack, Daniel, Tina, for coming on The Blind Abilities and sharing your initiative, your goals, the challenge that you put ahead of you, and more importantly, bringing awareness to the blindness community. And good luck to the entire Team C2C. And thank you so much for being so inclusive on who you're putting on the team, whether it's handicapped, blindness, vision impaired. Good job, Daniel, Tina, Jack, and thank you for being on Blind Abilities. Thanks, and on your way to June 17th, 2018. There you go. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Tina. Thanks so much for having us on. And thanks, Dan. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate being here with you. Such a great experience talking to Team C2C. And be sure to check them out on the web at teamc2c.com. That's Team S-E-A-T-O-S-E-E -E -E, and on Facebook at Team C2C. And also be sure to check out American Foundation for the Blind on the web. That's at AFB.org. And also check out the website for the United States Association of Blind Athletes. That's USABA.org. And all the music that you heard throughout the podcast was written, created, and produced by Chi Chow at L-C-H-E-E-C-H-A-U. We thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed. And until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through each other's, each other's eyes, eyes, we can then, we can then begin, begin to bridge, bridge the gap between, between the limited expectations and the reality and the realities of blind abilities. The realities of blind abilities. Of blind abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at Blind Abilities. Download our app from the App Store, Blind Abilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.